Evening. Um, I'm Ted Hodgkinson from the British Council. Um, very briefly, um, the British Council, you, you've heard today, but uh, my job is I work on um, our literature pro programme in South Asia, the Middle East and North Africa. Um, people often ask, what do you do at the British Council? When we did an event um, in Londonderry recently, someone asked me if I was the British Council's in-house David Tennant impersonator. <laughs> um, I'm not, but... Um, after every 10 minutes, the Doctor Who theme tune music will play to let you know that you've had enough time. <laughs> it's, um, I'm just going to introduce the poets very briefly. Um, hello as well to our live streaming audience who are watching online, and welcome to you. Um, do tweet in. The hashtag is ILS Showcase. Uh, sorry, IL Showcase. Um, just very briefly, I think there's four poets who share the stage with me today. I'm delighted to share the stage with. Um, they have incredibly distinctive and different um, sensibilities and personalities as poets. Um, but I think one thing they do share in common is that they often reshape language to break new ground, throw new light on unsung experiences. Zafar Kunal's poems are a halfway house between two linguistic experiences humming with his father's mountain speech of Urdu and his own lyrical reflective English. Rebecca Goss's most recent collection explores grief in the often alienating environment of hospitals, the internal landscape of bereavement mapped poignantly onto the cold distance of the clinical world. Luke Kennard's poems test the limits of the form itself, leading us into a headlong rush of language into new ways of seeing. And Patient Zagbabi has taken Chaucer's Canterbury Tales and reignited them with modern speech and unearthed the pilgrims walking in our midst. Um, I'm just going to say a few brief words about Zafar in particular now, and he's um, then going to come up and read for 10 minutes. I'll then do a brief intro to each of the poets in turn before they read. Um, Zafar Kuna was born in Birmingham and lives in Cumbria, where he was most the most recent Wordsworth Trust poet in residence, a graduate of the LSE before moving to Grasmere to take up the residency in 2014. Zafar has worked for five years for Hallmark Cards in West Yorkshire. His poem, Hill Speak, was the prize winner in 2011, poetry, National Poetry Competition. This was the first po pub his first published poem and begins with the words, There is no dictionary for my father's language. Zafar's father is Kashmiri and his mother is English. In 2013, he won a major Northern Writers' Award. He was announced as a Faber New Poet in 2014, and his debut pamphlet was published by Faber and Faber in 2014. Later that year, he was commissioned to write a poetic response to the anniversary of the outbreak of the First World War, which he read at the Purcell Room at the South Bank Centre on National Poetry Day. Zafar's sequence of poems, The Shape Remembrance Takes, was part of a commemorative book, The Pity, published by the Poetry Society. The poem from that poppy is disarming and completely unforgettable. I really suggest you go and read it. Um, great, so without further ado, Zafar, do you want to come and read? Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, it's great to be here. Um, yeah, the organisers will know uh, how I nearly wasn't here, actually, because I lost my wallet on the way down uh, with my train ticket in and um, stranded for a while at Euston Station, but um, I'm here. So um, I'll, I'll begin with, um, I suppose, a poem that touches on the subject of transport, um, but um, mostly about language, probably. Um, he'll speak. There is no dictionary for my father's language. His dialect, for a start, is difficult to name. Even this taxi driver who talks it lacks the knowledge. Some say it's Pahari, hill speak. Others, Patwari or Pahari Patwari. Too earthy and scriptless to find a home in books. This mountain speech is a low language. Ours, no good. You should learn speak Urdu. I'm getting the runaround. Whatever it is, this talk going back did once have a script. Lunda in the reign of the Buddhists. So was Dad's speech some kind of dogri? Is it Kashmiri, Mirpuri? The differences are lost on me. I'm told it's part way towards Punjabi, but what that tongue calls Torda, Dad would agree was Dusanda, yours. Truly, though there are many dictionaries for the tongue I speak, it's the close by things I'm lost to say, things as pulsed and present as the back of this hand, never mind stumbling towards some higher plane. And either way, 
even at the rare moment I get towards, or, thank God, even getting to my point, I can't put into words where I've arrived. Um, so uh, this one's about uh, a very long and complicated English word, uh, the, the word the. <laughs> the word. I couldn't tell you now what possessed me to shut summer out and stay in my room, or at least attempt to, in bed mostly. It's my dad, standing in the doorframe, not entering, but pausing to shape advice that keeps coming back. Whatever is matter must enjoy the life. He pronounced this twice, and me, I heard wrongness in putting a the before life in two minds, ashamed, aware, that I knew better, though was stuck inside in a halfway house, that I'm native here, in a halfway house, like that sticking word, that definite article, half right, half wrong, still present between enjoy and life. Sorry about stopping halfway through that one. Thinking about my wallet, I think just... <laughs> I was thinking, I think I've left it at that... Uh, it was on Coach D, I think it was. <laughs> um, anyway, I'm always stuck between one word and another, it feels like. And um, this is another poem about words. Um, in this case, I suppose another long, complicated word, the word us. Um, so um, I'm from Birmingham, and... Uh, as was said, my, my, my dad's Kashmiri, but I never know whether to say Pakistani. With, I say I'm half English, but, but my mum uh, is actually half Scottish. Her, her mum was born and brought up in Aberdeen. So if, if I have to be half something, well, I don't know why she's, she's completely English. But, um, um, so I always struggle to kind of sum up in a, in a word, really, what, where I was from. I, I would say Birmingham, but of, often that's not enough. Um, and this word, us, I would sometimes hear my father's relatives use the word us, and I wouldn't always know if my mum was included in that. And sometimes I'd hear other people use the word us without knowing if my father was allowed into that. Um, and I also thought that my parents were different in so many ways. There was kind of oceans between them, really. And so this is about the word us as a kind of space that holds wide waters. Us. If you ask me, us takes in undulations each wave in the sea, all insides compressed, as if from one sorry, coast you could reach out to the next. And maybe it's a Midlands thing, but when I was young, us equally meant me, says the one. Oi, you, tell us where you're from. And the way football fans share the one fate, I, being one, and Liverpool, no less. Cresting the Mexican wave of we and us. A shore-like state, two places at once. God knows what's in it. And at opposite ends, my heart sunk at separations of us. When it comes to us, colour me unsure. Something in me or it has failed the course. I'd love to think I could stretch to it, us, but the waves therein are too wide for words. I hope you get here where I'm coming from. I hope you're with me on this, between love and loss, where I'd give myself away, stranded, as if the universe pulls on one stress, us. I hope from here on I can say it, and though far-fetched, it won't be too far wrong. Um, um, actually, I'll, I'll read that, the, the poppy poem, um, um, which I wrote for the World War I um, anniversary. And poppies are obviously a symbol connected with remembrance, but they go back a long way in, in human history, and they're also connected with forgetting. So this is addressed to the spirit of the poppy. Poppy who crops up wherever ground is opened, 
broken. No, this is not enough. Who crops up where acidic ground is neutralized. In Belgium, blasted bones and rubble added their twist of lime, turning the disturbed earth red. No, this is not enough. Then where seeds lay buried, dormant, those older than I am, catching light, can stir from their long sleep in time, like history, raising a hand, a head. No, this is not enough. Remember, who's there in the first script, in a Mesopotamian tablet, hull and gill, joy flower, a cuneiform cocktail, our earliest remedy, who begot war in China, was named by Arabs, Abu el Noom, father of sleep, a bloody sign of, of love's martyrdom, Gul Elala, flower of red in Persian and Urdu. Remember, beloved of Persephone, also found in the tomb like a watch worn on the wrist of Tutankhamun and on coins issued by Herod. No, this is not enough. You need more. Who crops up fringing the banks of Lethe after Troy, who bridges forgetfulness and memory, life and death, relief and pain, who was loved by Coleridge, who wished that I could wrap up the view from my house in a pill of opium and send it to you to be seen, swallowed, whole again. No, this is not enough. Who was the minded flower Shakespeare partly saw in all the drowsy syrups of the world, a release from grief that calls for more far-fetched relief. And as morphine sent your sap through my mother's veins, while she could still hear me, while life remained in those hands that first held me, first calmed my small fevered brain. No, this is not enough. Whose pupil is a void dilating with light, its first and last entry, a compound eye in whichever form who sees the black dot of the beginning, who's there on that date when all the wands meet, looped in a wreath year upon year, or poked through the eye of a buttonhole. There, I'm done. No, this is not enough. Then, mother, mother, last word of that bleeding wrecked soldier, as heard by the last Tommy, the last link to living memory, spoken for now, like the countless millions of mouthless dead, there in the underworld, the fallen heavy head, the deaths we live with, enough said. Remember, this is you, wake up, you're summoned. No, this is not enough. Thank you very much. I love that poem. And um, a special, you know, um, kudos for getting here without your wallet. I think it takes a special talent to get all the way from London to Norwich without your wallet. Um, if anyone who's watching the live stream is on the train between Norwich and London, Coach D, can you just have a look? Um, uh, just very briefly to introduce Rebecca Goss, who's um, reading next. Uh, Rebecca Goss grew up in Suffolk and returned to live in the county in 2013 after spending 20 years in Liverpool. She has an MA in creative writing from Cardiff University and taught creative writing at Liverpool John Moores University for several years. Her work has been published in many literary journals, national newspapers and broadcast on BBC Radio 4. Her first collection, The Anatomy of Structures, was published in 2010 by Flambard Press and was praised for its strangeness, sexiness, and, occasional, and occasionally its yearning. Um, like that quote. Um, her second collection, Her Birth, was shortlisted for the 2013 Forward Prize for Best Collection, reviewing her birth um, in the Warwick Review. Lawrence Sale writes of its brilliant sparseness, consistently adding up to more than the sum of its parts. Rebecca is now a full-time writer and tutor of creative writing and lives in Suffolk. Just a brief word about the next three poets you're going to hear. They all at some point have been listed as, as a next generation poets list. Um, Rebecca and Luke are on the current list 2014 and Patience is an alumni from 2004. Um, so uh, that's 
Passify D. And also, you can get their uh, next generation uh, collection on the way out. So don't forget to do that as well. But Rebecca, do you want to say something? Thanks. Thank you, Ted, and hello, everyone. I'm going to read from the yearning one first. Yeah. Um, on holiday one year, uh, sitting at a beachside cafe in Portugal, uh, we were sitting beside another family, and uh, when they got up to leave, the teenage daughter as part of that family it suddenly became very obvious she only had one leg. And everybody in the restaurant stared at her, but I, I, I still believe to this day that I stared at her the most. And, you know, when you do that thing when you're looking at somebody and you know you really shouldn't be looking at them. Um, so when I got home from holiday, she kept appearing in my head. So I made her appear in this poem. A man greets his wife from her short break away. The first thing they do is embrace. Fat smiles stay on their faces all the way to the restaurant. He eats ribs with sticky, podgy fingers. She bites chicken wings with shiny lips. They have a pudding each and share another. In the car, she tells him about a girl she saw with a short spotted skirt that flapped around one long limb. There wasn't even a stump to satisfy me, just a space where the legs should have been. Was she very pretty? Yes, she was. They stopped talking and at traffic lights, he strokes her thigh instead of saying how sad her story sounds. Quietly, he resents the one-legged girl for changing the mood between them, resents his wife for telling him the tale at all. Making love to her later, it's a pretty teenager sitting astride his wide belly, one leg tucked behind, leaving the torso smooth and deformed, moving over him. I discovered something about racing pigeons. Never thought I was going to write a poem about racing pigeons. But I discovered a term. It's called widowhood. And it's the term used to describe the period racing pigeons spend apart from their mate during flights. So basically, the night before a race, the pigeon is caged together with its mate. They have one last sexy night together. And then the pigeon is released in the morning. And the reason it flies back so quickly is because it's desperate to see its mate again. It's had a taste of pigeon action, if you like. Anyway, I actually thought this was terribly romantic. <coughs> pigeon love. I know he sweats in his bed about me. Nights before races are longest. As he dreams of the money my feathers can make him, sees my eager beak pointing towards home. Nights like this are hard for me too, caging us together, my love and I, leaving me to nudge her plumy neck, peck that secret part beneath her wing. He relies on widowhood to get me back. Simple, but it works. Passion, sex, comfort, being parted from all that makes me fly faster, guarantees I'm a winner. When that businessman in Taiwan bet $50,000, did he know he wagered on mourning and love? At six days old, they punched a ring on my leg, the number defining my lot, who I belonged to. And he does care for me, pets me with chubby, tender hands, but she's the one who increases my rapidity. Her softness accelerates swiftness. Lift up your wing, high so I can see. I'm coming home. Um, I'm going to finish with three poems from my, uh, my second collection, which is entirely different and completely autobiographical. Um, it is about the birth of my daughter, Ella. She was born in 2007 with severe Epstein's anomaly, which is a very rare and incurable heart condition, and she lived for 16 months. The book is split into three sections. The beginning um, is um, from Ella's birth to her death. The middle section is about my life without her. And the final section is about the birth of my second child. I'll read um, a poem from each section. Um, Ella was diagnosed shortly after birth, in which was a very surreal time. And suddenly, my husband and I found ourselves immersed in not only a new place, a new space. We had to spend a lot of time in hospital. We couldn't go home with her, but also a new language. Suddenly, we had to acquire all these medical terms or certainly un try and understand them. Suddenly, I was using the words tricuspid valve on a regular basis. I'd never used the word tricuspid before, not out loud anyway. And this is... 
this is about one particular medical word, this first poem, and I did actually understand it, but I was in complete denial about its understanding. Palliative. I knew what it meant, but that didn't stop me. I came home from clinic early in her life, sat on the stairs with my hardback Collins, solid as a baby on my knee, thumbed quickly through papery leaves, whispering LMNOP to seek the word they said once when discussing the flawed mechanics of her heart. There, on a gauzy page, its definition printed across shadows of my fingers, I read, serving to palliate, from Latin, pallium, a cloak, and turned back to find palliate, verb one, to lessen the severity of pain, disease, etc., without curing. And I reread without curing until curing didn't look like curing anymore. It looked like curling. And I clasped my hands around my knees, pulled that book hard against my gut. As a student, I loved its reams of indisputable fact, its ability to reveal and make clear. Now I bury its bulk on the shelves, swathe myself in hope. I um, don't think that my, um, my body has changed that much since having babies. My husband may disagree with that statement, and, and um, I'll admit to a sturdier bra, but the, um, the, this idea, I didn't get any stretch marks when I was pregnant with Ella, and this is seen as a sort of, this is seen as an achievement in pregnancy. This is what they tell you. But actually, after she died, I really wanted them. And it was all about wanting some kind of proof that I had been a mother, because suddenly I found myself pramless in the high street. I couldn't walk into a playground anymore. I couldn't walk down the nappy aisle in Asda. I was suddenly cut off from all these places that identified me as a mother and I just longed for some kind of physical branding. Stretch marks. My swims kept those scars at bay. 2,000 lengths it took to form my mapless globe. No trace she was here. Her travels around me refused to surface as she dived between poles, lapped that black belly ocean. Once born, meridian of my achievements, she went off course. I followed her divergent route, but this was not her geography. I have wished for them, a record of her tracks, all snowed over, gone. I'll finish with a poem about euphemisms or about one particular euphemism. I don't actually um, find it difficult to use the word death. I can talk about the death of my daughter or say that my daughter died, but this is about... Um, one particular euphemism that I heard myself say one day, it sort of escaped from my mouth. And as soon as I heard myself say it, I was struck by how inadequate it was. Lost. Walking with my baby in the park and slowing for someone I hadn't seen in years, I heard myself interrupting coups to say, you know I lost my first child, don't you? As if there were a possibility she might turn up again with my glove or best pen that a sweep of the sofa might reward me her hand, then body pulled from the gap between cushions. As if all I did was lose sight of her, that an anxious scan of sand could bring her into focus, squat and peering at shells. As if I could swear I had hold of her earlier, that a frantic spill of my bag would bear lip gloss, chewing gum keys, and I'd be unable to explain, apologising for my dreadful mistake. As if one day... I could run from my house screaming found, lift her for the whole road to see, shouting, here she is, here she is, she is here. Thank you very much. And, and Rebecca's actually been doing some work recently in hospitals where you've been reading those poems and it's actually been kind of unlocking possibilities and, and maybe even helping them to understand how certain the theatrics of hospitals might be a slightly dehumanising thing in some ways, is that right? With, with, with medical students actually, not right. Oh, not right. Yeah, so sort of get them before they're on site as it were. Um, yeah, and uh, it has been very interesting, the, the, the sort of language of bad news and how, mm. how you communicate <coughs> and what, what roles you adopt as doctor and patient and other lines you can cross over when it comes to talking about difficult things. So interesting. Thank you very much. Um, 
Our next reader is Luke Kennard, the author of four collections of poetry and a novella called Holofin. His first book, The Solex Brothers, won him an Eric Gregory Award for the, from the Society of Authors in 2005. His second, The Harbour Beyond the Movie, made him the youngest writer to be shortlisted for the Forward Prize for Best Collection in 2007. He was also published, he's also published two pamphlets, The Planet-Shaped Horse and The ne Necropolis Boat, which won the Poetry Society's pamphlet choice in 2012 and surely should win some, some other award for best titles as well. Um, his latest, A Lost Expression, was published by Salt in 2012. Um, his literary criticism has appeared in the TLS, The National, and numerous poetry and short fiction journals. Um, he lectures at the University of Birmingham and is working on his first novel. And I have to say, he has a genius for metaphor as well and recently read a poem for us on our uh, podcast the line that stuck in my head was disappointment kicked him like an ostrich um, <laughs> which um, I just think is brilliant um, Luke do you want to come and read thank you thank you it's lovely to be here thanks for listening just trying to draw myself back from the edge of, uh, of crying uh, after Rebecca's reading, which always has an effect on me. Um, I'm going to start with this um, little prose poem, sort of square-shaped prose poem, uh, called My Friend, which is in the form of a, I suppose, looking at a kind of uh, a medieval prayer where you reiterate the same idea or the same kind of moral bind over and over again, which is what this poem tries to, tries to do. My Friend. My friend, your irresponsibility and your unhappiness delight me. Your financial problems and your expanding waistline are a constant source of relief. I am so happy you drink more than I do and that you don't seem to enjoy it as much. When I hear you being arrogant and argumentative, my heart leaps. Your nihilism is fast becoming the richest source of meaning in my life and it is my pleasure to watch you speaking harshly to others. When you gossip about our mutual acquaintances, I sigh with satisfaction. Your childish impatience delights me. The day you threw a tantrum in the middle of the supermarket was the happiest day of my life. <laughs> Sometimes you say something which reveals you to be rather stupid, and I love you then, but not as much as I love you as when you are callously manipulative. Your promiscuity is like a faithful dog at my side. When you talk about your petty affairs, you try to make them sound grand and important. I cherish your gaucheness and your flippancy. At times it seems you are actually without a sense of humour. I bless the day I met you. You bully people younger and weaker than you, and when others tell me about this, I am pleased. Sometimes I think you are incapable of love, and I am filled with the contentment of waking on a Saturday morning to realise I don't have to go to work. I often suspect that you do not really even like me, and my laughter overflows like water from a blocked cistern. Thank you. I wrote that before my two boys were born, so now the, the line, the day you threw a tantrum in the middle of the supermarket, has a completely different resonance for me and sort of is making me feel quite stressed even just thinking about it. So, um, my, my editor for this collection, who was the, the wonderful uh, uh, Roddy Lumsden, was very good to work with, and I sent him probably about 120 pages of, uh, of poems, most of which um, he quite accurately accused me of, of lapsing into a kind of self-parody and just trying to do what I've been doing in the last three collections and doing it sort of less well with less confidence. Um, and he, his challenge, after sort of cutting the 120 pages down to about, about five, was to go away and, and, and write, um, write some new, obviously write some new stuff. The book wouldn't have, uh, wouldn't have had enough pages in it if I hadn't. Um, but one of, his, one of his challenges, which was a really good thing for me, I think, was to sort of go away and try to write some things that I wouldn't normally, normally write. So he said, you must write at least one love poem. Go and just try and write one sincere love poem and wean you off irony, Kennard, he said. Um, and I tried to do this. And it kind of coincided with my brother-in-law getting married and... Um, and he wanted something for, his, for the ceremony as well, so it kind of went okay in that way. The two briefs coincided, you could say. Um, um, and it has the conceit of a, of a sort of terrible Victorian novel, which, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the bad ones have even sort of more coincidence in them than, than Thomas Hardy's novels, you know, which are full of coincidence, but are still brilliant. Um, so lots of forgotten ones, but they're still sort of bound and still look like wonderful uh, canonical books on the, on the shelf in pubs where you see them these days. And it's called Leatherbound Road. Should anybody ask me how we met, I'll read them Ansel Adams on photography. I'll say it's in the way the artist brings out of the landscape what the frame brings out of the painting. 
which is to say you bring out the best in me, but not the way the Maillard reaction brings out the best in food through the combination of amino acids, reducing sugars and heat. No, it's more the way the right wine brings out the right light and the scene reflected in your eye places me front and centre, peering in, trying to describe the colour. It's what the singer does between the words that makes the words the words and not just words. The way the crows that current stud the risen green don't startle as I cycle through and crunch the gears. The Canada goose that turns its neck 180 to rifle through its feathers rolodex. The way distracted weavers weave their hair into the tapestry, a chess move made six hours ago, which only makes sense now. The way the symphony only opens up when you know what's coming next, your place in it and why or not. The way the past's not even past, and looking back I overlook the beauty of the worst of it. The exam flunked, the form misfiled, the blown bulb and the curtain drawn which gave the bar its votive glow. The way that led with more coincidence and happenstance than a minor Victorian novel, and yet with the absolute conviction of its binding and with gratitude to you. I want to read some, uh, some new ones, so, 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 so I will. Um, and uh, yeah, so part of uh, having having gone through that 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 editing experience, I sort of I, I felt like I I wanted to write more personal and slightly autobiographical stuff, I guess, and then and then I stopped doing that altogether. I wrote one more poem that was in in that kind of form, and then I became obsessed with the um, the narrative of Cain from Genesis and um, Cain Cain and Abel, um, partly from reading um, Coleridge's fragment, The Wanderings of Cain. So after Cain is is cursed and sent off, he just uh, supposedly wanders around the world. There are certain traditions that hold that part of his curse is that he becomes immortal and wanders in perpetuity around, around the world, around the land, of, the land of Nod, is where he's first set off to start uh, wandering. Some of the sort of, the sort of uh, awfully uh, literalistic interpretations of that um, had him wandering around the land of Nod, nodding. The part of his curse was to nod, which, which, is, which they literally just got from the fact that it was the land of, the land of Nod. In fact, actually, Nod has links to nomadic, I think, as a word, and it just, just means to wander. You know, it's, not, it's not that at all. But um, this happens. Um, also, there are, there are some wonderful um, texts in the, in the Midrash. There are these books called the, the Targums, which were written by, by rabbis and sort of interpolated and, and wrote into the stories in the, the, that were fairly sparse. But there's very little information, actually, in the Cain and Abel story. And there's not even any agreement on what the mark of Cain was, and it's been interpreted by various different traditions and religions and denominations over the years in different ways, um, usually in slightly sort of xenophobic ways, depending on who they hate. They decide that the mark of Cain is probably that he was French or something like that. Um, there, there was even an idea that maybe he, um, he was given a dog, that the mark was that he was given a dog to protect him from everybody who'd want to slay him because he was the first murderer. One of the Targums has him having a tiny horn in the middle of his forehead, which talks, which announces that he's, he's a murderer wherever he goes. Um, but that's kind of an aside. I've been using all that kind of material. It's sort of displacement activity in a way, the research, rather than actually writing poems. Um, another um, tradition within sort of Hebrew studies, I suppose, is that of the, the anagrams. So I've been messing around with, with anagrams quite a lot recently. So I took this passage, which I particularly like because it's about tilling the ground and it not yielding its, 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 its strength, not yielding fruit. So I wanted to use the, that particular passage um, to try to till it for other stories, other narratives, other language and words. So it's four verses from the, from the KGV. The bit that begins, and the Lord said unto Cain, where is Abel thy brother? And Cain sort of says, what brother? What's a brother? Um, and tries to get out of it. Um, the one thing to, uh, so there are 355 letters in, in that passage, in those five verses. Um, and for it to be a perfect anagram, you have to use obviously exactly those letters in exactly the same frequency. And there are 42 E's, which is good, that's very useful. But there are also 41 H's, because there are a lot of haths and these and thous in the King, in the King James Version. Um, so that's quite difficult. So there are a lot of H words in, in, this, in this sequence, which I'll read a few of. Um, two words which I'll define, although they're not necessarily the most obscure in there. Um, um, Holothurian is the genus of the, the sea cucumber. I'm quite fond of sea cucumbers as an animal. I think they're an extraordinary and, and odd thing. Um, and also uh, drogue. And the word drogue um, refers to the tiny parachute. I've never been a skydiver at all, but the tiny parachute that comes out and pulls out the main parachute. So without the drogue, the main parachute would not be pulled out. There would not be sufficient force to pull out the main parachute. The rest of it, I expect, to make perfect sense to you. There's, oh yeah, another thing, it, it threw up an, the name um, Father K, which I've taken as a sort of uh, a Henry-like alter ego, so like H is to uh, the Berryman dream songs as Father K is to this sequence. So that, that's, that's kind of me, Father K. Cain and Father K share a property, a hutch in the suburb of bachelorhood, overhung by cheesecloth shoehorned with mutton and things re-abbreviated. The hairy household mythologist and his adherent undertow. Ornamentation, a hat, a bunch of rhododendrons. Diadem, the width of a yacht. O 17th endowment, 
Don't try to thwart the stammered buffet. This, the trillionth interlude. The button hook will have his thread. The drogue, her logoria. Chapter 2. Father K takes bourbon in the bathtub. Why, that escalated fast. Whenever he unhands it, he shivers. I say we are unthinkably connected. His retort, a wooded tarot rant. Third odour hushed with boyhood horrors. I have never seen death that uncompetitive. Get the uninterpreted blamange, she says. Forward it to the hearthlight. O oh, rhombohedral monolith to the hundredth motherhood. O oh, tenth cheetah hemorrhaging by domed foothills. A cloud of flies. Their toothy neurons out. Ada in... Um, in, uh, in certain readings of the, uh, the, uh, the, the story, he was um, Cain's sister and obviously his wife as well. There were only four people alive. Um, so Ada arrives. Doorbell. It is Ada in Burberry, bathed in hall light. Ada, rosebud torturer, co-author of Overset Thermometers. Ada, outshining hydrogen trinketry. Ada, soothed their wrathful orphanhood, then come hither, nutrient. Ada, heavyweight statuette. Ada, handbook for flesh data and VAT theft. The lighthouse den where redemption inducts honey. Ada, brunette, attention deficit disorder, old mouthwash. Ada, tetchy demon and conventional Frenchwoman. Death, wishbone, horseshoe. She hugs me, whispers... Ditto, bitch. <laughs> Chapter 5. We enrol at HRH Ethelred University at Ada's behest. Kane has taken ten evening modules. One, arsehole theory. Two, misunderstanding 101. Three, heartburn studies. Four, the novelette. Five, troubleshooting the mythraditized. The modern underachiever. Draw in H, 2H, 3H, 4H, 5H, 6H, 7H, 8H and 9H and rub out. Six, footnote clutter. Seven, not safe for work. Father K studies doubt, Hebrew, the churchy batholith, bird orthography, to deflower the footpath and ha-ha, cotton mouth, non-conformity and downloaded hoodoo. Ada merely takes threat and bayonetting. <laughs> Chapter 7. Lethargy in knitwear, the drabbest thunder. Father K botches another investigation. The corroborated brotherhood of Hood's telephone. Have hashish? No? A toll booth ha- <coughs> excuse me. A toll booth haberdasher hid by a eunuch at the threshold of the mint. Cain went in holothuri and stupor, diverting the headway, a motherfucker. Had we overdosed on thought, TNT, that, the house sledgehammer rewound, cotton-mouthed with fame, incredulity, and me, the lacrimator, his ferry untethered and null. He'd hid there, beheld Ada highlighted and bicarbonate attention. A halo hovered over her headboard the front. You'd have your social disorder honoured as a coup de théâtre, so much synthetic chutney. Father K formed a sudden lisp. Sorry, I'm tenth. I'm quite tenth today. Now he foments in her wardrobe, overwhelmed. Have to be something here. THC, the fluttering sonata's titillation. She narrows her eyes. When the attaché shows us round the motherland, you ask one thing. How bombproof. Just a couple more. One of them's a play, so I won't read that one because it's 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 uh, it would require a cast of four. So that wouldn't work. I'll do this one, which is a, a mid-season report from the um, from the uh, the uh, the TV uh, controllers, the producers who are trying to produce this as a show. E report from the DH in HD and 3D. We like the brother. Can we bring the brother in again, please? Suggestions. Horror, bromance, homeopathic subordination, DT's, death. Strengths and threats. Father K is a duodenum. He absorbs irony. This means both. The verve is currently outdated. The decathlon, a collaboration with the laundry woman. <laughs> You're heedful how the unlovely detente equals duff. But what of theatricality, voodoo, entertainment? The last two. This one is a, a short failed sonnet in the Shakespearean rather than Petrarchan. It has 13 lines. There weren't enough letters. Attenuator of the unknown runes, monthly portfolio manoeuvres, a hanky held aloft to hired goons, hideouts tattooed somewhere in Hanover. The childhood whitewash, shootable birthdays, second, fifth, sixth and tenth, enshrouded the dartboard hum, her holohedral taciturnity, the governable hatchet note of fire shifts pentameter virus, the coward, hatching horror in the dun battleground, henceforth the absinthe dow painted in HB, my head besieged, my heart the trebuchet. I'll finish on this one, um, which is um, in which Cain marks me. B minus, that was the last letter left in this, which was useful for that. B minus. 
Father K, you are a hater, the standard liberal monotony, thinking all that is persecuted must be the truth. Ha. But no, some things are merely persecuted. O oh, Fido, thitherward round the houses, hold the hard hat, hold the standby bandana. You launch the featherweight countercharge, the mere badminton, the waterfront hotbed. You're of the neon ivy federation. The moonlight fornicator had more worth. This is how behaviour devolved. Thank you for listening. Do you want me to plug the event this evening? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, amazing reading. And next reading is Patience Agbarbi, um, one of the UK's foremost poets. She studied English li language and literature at Oxford and is a former poet laureate of Canterbury. Her writing and performance has been featured on radio and TV worldwide. She's the author of four books, Raw, Transformatrix, Bloodshot Monochrome and Telling Tales. Telling Tales is an exhilarating multicultural remix of the Canterbury Tales, which mines the Middle English masterwork for its performance as well as its poetry and pilgrims. Following a book launch at Southwark Cathedral, Patience toured the book to a range of literary venues and festivals with literature producing agents, um, agency Renaissance One. Um, she's also doing a full length performance of that this evening, and I urge you all to go. I know there's a literary lock in as well, but I don't want to, you know, cause a um, clash in the programme, but she's doing that. And if you if you were able to go, it's fantastic. Um, and without further ado, here she is. Thank you. Well, unfortunately, Port of Correction, I'm not doing the whole lot tonight. Oh, you're not? No, I'm performing at the Literary Lock-In, and I'm doing, I'm doing ten, by now, I'll do ten minutes, so you get a little, little taste of it. But what I've been asked to do, for the, thank you very much for, for inviting me to this showcase. Um, it's great to be here. Um, yes, I've been asked to, to actually read from Transmatrix, my second book, because that was the book that, um, where I was nominated for the uh, Next Generation Poets 2004. So... Um, it came out 15 years ago. It's quite weird sort of going back in time and, and, um, and revisiting some of these poems. And I'd like to um, begin with um, the second poem in the book. It begins with a kind of pro prologue. And the second poem in the book is very autobiographical. Um, it's, it's called Ufo Woman. And it's, um, it's my life from the ages of naught to 10, really. I was, I was born in London to Nigerian parents and then raised... Um, with a white English foster family for until I was 18, actually. So I've got two sets of parents. So there are references to Sussex. When I was 10, I went to Nigeria for the first time. And um, it's really about, um, yeah, I, I won't say what it's about. I'll just read the poem. So Ufo woman is pronounced, it's spelt UFO, obviously pronounced Ufo, a neologism. Ufo woman. Mother Earth, Heathrow, Terminal 5, yo. Do I look hip in my space hopper green slingbacks, iridescent sky blue pink skin pants and hologram haircut? Can I have my clothes back when you finish with them, please? Hello? I just got off of the spaceship. I've learnt the language, read the VDU, and watched the video twice. Mother Earth, do you read me? Why then stamp my passport alien at Heathrow? Did I come third in the world race? Does my iridescent sky blue pink skin embarrass you, mother? London. Meandering the streets paved with hopscotch and butterscotch. Kids with crystal cut ice cream cones and tin can eyes ask, why don't UFO back to your own planet? Streets paved with NF, no fun graffiti. Nefertiti go home from the old days. So, I take a tube, tram, train, taxi trip, hip-hugged, bell-bottomed and thick-lipped, landing in a crazy, crazy cowpat, Sussex. Possibly, it's my day-glow afro, rich as a child paints a tree in full foliage that makes them stare with flying saucer eyes. Or, my antennae plaits in winter, naked twigs cocooned in thread for bigger, better hair, make them dare to ask to touch. Can we touch your hair or not ask at all? Or my two-toned hands with their translucent palm, lifeline, heartline, headline, children, journeys, prompting the, why is it white on the inside of your hand? Do you wash? Does it wash off? All my core names, trochaic, dactylic, 
galactic beats from ancient poetry. Names they make me repeat, make them call me, though sticks and stones may break my bones, but names. In times of need, I ask the oracle. Withdrawing to my workstation, I press help. I have just two options. History. The screen displays subliminal visuals from the old days, which I quickly translate. Slave ship. Spaceship. Racism. Spacism. Resignedly, I select herstory, and the screen displays a symmetrical tree that has identical roots and branches. I can no longer reason, only feel, not aloneness, but oneness, and I decide to physically process this data. So take the train, plane to the equator, the motherland, travel five degrees north to the go slow, quick talking, fast living, finger licking city known as Lagos. Streets paved with gold-threaded, gold-extensioned women and silk-suited men. Market stalls of red, orange, yellow and indigo. Perhaps it's not my bold, wild skin colour, well camouflaged in the spectrum of life, but the way I wear my skin, too uptight, too did I wear the right outfit today, too I just got off the last London flight. Or my shy, intergalactic lingo, my monospeak, my verbal vertigo that makes them stare with flying saucer eyes. They call me Ufo Woman, or Yubo from the old days, which translates as weirdo, white, outsider, other. And I withdraw into myself. No psychedelic shield, no chameleonic facade, just raw. Then I process Ufo and UFO, Realise the former is a blessing, the latter a curse. So I rename myself Ufo Woman and touch base at Heath Row. No, don't bother to strip, drug, bomb search me. Don't bother to strip, drug, bomb search me. I'm not staying this time. Why press rewind? Why wait for first world homo sapiens to cease their retroactive racism? Their world may be a place worth fighting for but I suggest in the next millennium. So, smart casual, I prepare for liftoff. In my fiber octet Firefly Levi's, my sci-fi hi-fi playing revelations, and my intergalactic mobile on. Call me, I'll be surfing the galaxy, searching for that perfect destination. Okay, um, well, Transformatrix was, it was very much a book about um, women going through a form of change, whether it be physical or psychological. I mean, that one was obviously all about me, but heavily fictionalised. So I'd now like to share um, a couple of poems from the central sequence, because another thing trans Transformatrix was about was form, was working with poetic forms, and in particular working with older poetic forms and seeing their potential for performance was really sort of going back right to their roots. So a form like the Sestina, this old French form, although if you go to uh, northern Spain, they will claim it as their own as well. Um, but this, it's an amazing form where you have six end words and they play a kind of dance, mathematical dance, at the end of each stanza. And then you end up with a final three-line stanza where you get all the six words. So I really love the kind of... The, the the potential for musical play with, with that particular form, which of course was originally, they were originally sung by the troubadours back in 13th century France. So, um, so the one I'm going to share, in fact I'm going to share two of them, um, the one that's quite close to my heart, it's called The Tiger, it's about tattoos, because um, back in 2000 I was poet in residence in a tattoo studio as um, as, um, in fact, it was in 1999, as part of the Poetry Society's po po Poets in Residence. They had met, they'd got money from the National Lottery, and poets were all over the place in really unusual places, and I was lucky enough to, to go in a tattoo studio in North London. So, so this was written just before I did my residency, and it's called The Tiger. Love, hate in black and blue the first time. Miss Carter wrote, Tracy is a very bright girl but she plays the fool like a veteran. That weekend, I tasted salt sweet lust and lost my childhood somewhere along the beach. The boy was Darren Smith. It was damp dark, hair standing on end dark. 
I wore a black polar neck for weeks. The next time was the last day of school when some boy scrawled slag on my graffiti blouse and my girlfriend scribbled it into an ugly scar. The first child to abandon school, I marched to the end of the pier, the bleached blonde end of an era, wishing for the anonymity of dark. And later, I rolled up my sleeve like a child giving blood for the first time. Tracy loves Darren. It was girl power, 1979. He was my aerosol boy and the swelling inscription, my life boy. We lasted a month. The next time was South End 1980. The receptionist was Tank Girl, the tattooist, Corella Deville, who stitched hot dark ink into my taut flesh as time flowed free in a corset of glass. I was a child bride, married to the needle, and our child was the fine line distinction like girl, boy, a miracle of living flesh. Time was exquisite, subcutaneous pain, and the end marked the beginning. A jet dark, old gold tiger, draped across my shoulder, no girl is fully dressed without one. Tank girl, jotted down the next appointment like a child had just learnt to write, while the thick dark ink stained my frayed punk boy t-shirt. Poked, Tracy loves Darren with the end of her pen and winked. We'll cover him up in no time. It takes an hour to eliminate girl meets boy, a minute for childhood to end and for dark blue to fade to grey, a lifetime. Um, I mentioned that um, Chance of Matrix was about women going through change. There's also, um, there's one or two in here who are, I don't know, kind of play with the notion of womanhood in the broadest sense. So this one's um, very much a very, a very London-centric poem, I'd say. A lot of my, I'm astonished at how many of my poems are London-centric, and they still continue to be so. Um, okay, this one's called Ms. Demeanor. It's midnight, party time, time for a girl to hit the West End so hard it shrieks like a child lover boy. Don't you just adore the dark, the funky smell of the dark? Midnight chimes, time for boy meets girl in the mirror. And wild child, bitch with a dick from Crouch End, becomes wild West End diva with dark luscious lashes, courtesy of every child's dream, fairy godmother. Time to lose a glass slipper, Cinderella. Diamonds are a girl's best friend, and boy, oh boy, I'm harder than a brickie from Ma End. A girl's gonna do what a girl's gonna do. Strap it in before the pumpkin carriage beeps its dark bulbous time to hit the road horn. Now I'm a child, the bastard child of Barbara Cartland and Boy George. In a sequin shift, checking the time on a Rolex, I hear the wheels scrape the end of the street and I dive into the dark. Go, girl, strut your funky stuff, girl, because the night's a hyperactive child on E129 and the dark is every boy's sheath. West End is where it's at and it's party time. Let the wild child burn the wick at both ends, for the time is ripe. For girls who are boys in the dark. Um, yeah, as I say, I was very much playing with form in this book, and um, it begins with a kind of very irregular rap, and it sort of morphs, the forms morph as you go through the book, and, and I end with, a, with three sonnets. And um, interestingly, my, my subsequent book, Bloodshot Monochrome, is almost all sonnets, so I sort of seem to work through a particular form and kind of do it to death and then, and then move on. Um, but, um, but the poem I'm going to end with, Transformatrix, uh, is the title, the title poem. Is, um, it's playing with that notion of a sonnet being a corset. Some people still feel that the sonnet's a very male form. Um, I don't think it is particularly, although, you know, it's clearly the Elizabethan men rather, rather liked it and, you know, used to use it to sort of show their manhood almost. Um, so I wanted to subvert that, really. And I wanted to celebrate creativity, and in particular writing. So this one goes out for everyone today at this showcase, because I know almost everybody in the room is a writer. We're all writers here. Um, Transformatrix. I'm slim as a silver stiletto, lit by a fat waxing moon, and a seance of candles dipped in oil of frankincense. 
Salt peppers my lips as the door clicks shut. A pen poised over a blank page. I wait for Madam's orders, her strict consonants and the spaces between words, the silence. She's given me a safe word, a red light, but I'm breaking the law on a death wish, ink throbbing my temples, each vertebra straining for her fingers. She trusses up words, lines, as a corset disciplines flesh. Without her, I'm nothing. But without me, she's tense, uptight, rigid as a full stop. Thank you for listening. Thank you again to the four fantastic poets who have been reading today. Um, Zafar Kuniel, Luke Cannard, Rebecca Goss and Patience Akbarbi. Um, now we know partly what's going to be happening at the Literary Lock-In. That was a mystery until now, but it's been unlocked. Um, and thank you to everybody who's been watching online and um, 